Since liftoff Sunday, it's been a serious business, but the Apollo 10 team has never allowed it to become a matter of gravity. Bruce Morton reports from the Manned Spacecraft Center in Houston. One little noticed milestone on this flight, David, the return of the sandwich to space. John had a corned beef sandwich, you'll remember, aboard Gemini 3, but the corned beef was a little gamey by the time Young got to it, and the experiment never did exactly work. This time, Young and his colleagues have two spreads, ham salad and chicken salad, in tubes. They can squeeze them onto either party rye or white. Each slice is vacuum sealed, the man in charge of food here said, in its own little spacesuit. The man in charge is a veterinarian, by the way, and takes some kidding about meals even a dog wouldn't eat. But he did let us sample the bread. The vacuum sealing makes it look funny, like a piece of shiny plastic, but it really does taste like bread. The astronauts also have some sea ration type meals they can heat and eat, a great triumph. But everything else is still freeze dried, little grayish blocks of something or other, to which Stafford, Young, and Cernan add water. It doesn't exactly make your mouth water, but I guess it works. For connoisseurs like you, David, of earlier space menus, I should add that everybody still likes the bacon squares and those strawberry cereal cubes still aren't selling. David? They should try eating at the CBS cafeteria to steal from another network. Uh, we're standing by now for television pictures from space within the next few minutes. We should explain that the ground receiving station, Goldstone in Southern California, is not quite in the uh, proper relationship with the spacecraft for the very best quality pictures. They'll be able to use only their smaller antenna, their 85-foot antenna at Goldstone for the first few minutes of this broadcast instead of the huge 210-foot dish. The result of that will be probably uh, snow in the picture, at least in the early stages. CBS News color coverage of the flight of Apollo 10 will continue in a moment. A good quality TV picture in Madrid doesn't do us much good. We've managed to bridge the gap from here to the moon, but uh, there's still an Atlantic Ocean in our way. We'll give it to him for just a short bit in about uh, 10 minutes. Can you tell us, man, we don't want to uh, just keep holding the camera here. We have a few other things to do. We'll give it to him in 10 minutes for a short run over. Uh, Roger, uh, Tim, we suggest uh, you hold off till we get acquisition, and we'll uh, give you the word on acquisition at Goldstone. Over. So it appears there will be a delay of about 10 more minutes as we wait for television pictures today from Apollo 10. On a, another matter, a verdict is expected today from the judge in the Sirhan trial, the man who has been found guilty of the murder of Robert Kennedy. Senator Edward Kennedy asked the court today to spare the life of Sirhan Sirhan for the murder of his brother. A letter from Senator Kennedy to Los Angeles District Attorney was presented to Superior Court Judge Herbert Walker in the courtroom shortly before the judge was to pass formal sentence on the 25-year-old immigrant whose death in the gas chamber was decreed by a jury which has convicted him of the assassination. Judge Walker does have the constitutional authority to reduce the sentence to life if he wishes. The last of the Kennedys wrote, and I'm quoting, my brother was a man of love and sentiment and compassion. He would not have wanted his death to be a cause for taking of another life. You may recall his pleas when he learned of the death of Martin Luther King. It's widely assumed that the commander of Apollo 10, Tom Stafford's enthusiasm for the extensive use of television was largely responsible for the installation of color cameras on Apollo 10. Unlike some other astronauts, this crew has strongly advocated giving television a prominent role in the moon landing program. In a recent conversation, I asked Stafford why. It came after Apollo 7, that when they first uh, had you know, television back from space. And it came of a fairly good quality then, but I said, uh, I know our technology can produce something a lot better than this. And also, from an engineering evaluation standpoint, we can do lots better. And I think that's one of the functions of the Space Administration, is to improve the state of the art. Also, I guess, the, whether it's a... Uh, a person in the news or television media or just a layman on the street, the first question most of them ask you is, well, how was it up there? And we've worked out a method so we can show you how it, it is at that time. And uh, say so the view is always fantastic, and, uh, but yet the only way we can relay it, you can hear us talking real time on the, on the communication links, and you can see high fidelity color film afterwards for just a short part. But this is something I think that can, can 
bring it out to, to all the people actually what we're doing in real time because you see the lift off everybody sees the lift off in real time you see the splash down this is just a continuation just about two hours ago when the astronauts were awakened mission control serenaded them with a record by robert goulet of on a clear day you can see forever so far at least uh, that does not appear to be true in television terms at least Four mid-course corrections uh, were scheduled during this period of time on the way out from the Earth. Uh, they skipped the first, did the second, not so much to really change their course as to improve the orbit of the moon, something they'd planned all along and therefore could not really be considered a mid-course correction. And then they passed by mid-course corrections three and four. They say that the one mile or so that they are off in their flight path is something that they can make up as they near the moon in their lunar orbit insertion burn later this evening, rather this afternoon. It seems the tracking people in Houston who are keeping watch with radar and radio over the progress of Apollo 10 don't like last minute changes in the trajectory. Bruce Morton at uh, the Manned Spacecraft Center in Houston, how are the families taking all of this excitement, uh, seeing their husbands and fathers on television? and live in color for a change. Well, David, I guess the answer is uh, with surface calm, at least. Uh, a couple of the wives, uh, Barbara Young and Barbara Cernan, have come into mission control once to watch on the, uh, on the great big color screen, which you can see now. You see they have the color bars up there. Otherwise, uh, except for the lonesome knots of reporters gathered outside each of the three houses here, it's, uh, it's pretty much life as usual. The children are all going off to school as they normally do. Uh, the wives find time to go out and go to the beauty parlor or go to the grocery store or whatever. Uh, they're worried, obviously, but they don't show it. There's the, the kind of community feeling here that I think you get in, uh, in a military post when a lot of the men are overseas. Uh, if it's your husband's first flight in space, why somebody else will drop over for coffee and tell you how it was the first time her husband went up. Uh, they're interested in the flight. They're not experts uh, by any means on all the technical aspects of it. They want to know uh, when Apollo 10 goes into orbit around the moon, but when people start talking to them in uh, terms of LOI-1 and LOI-2 and TEI and all those abbreviations that uh, we've all had to plow through, why they get about as baffled as I do sometimes. They get a good deal of mail, most of it from friends. The, uh, the mail from the public is large, but that... Uh, that generally goes to NASA first and is screened before the wives get it. And they also get mounds and mounds of newspapers, 15 or 20 newspapers delivered to each house each day. The reason being that uh, virtually all of the astronauts keep a scrapbook. Uh, sometimes they do it kind of like a quilting bee. Uh, friends come over and help them go through and clip out stories about the flights. But uh, Barbara Cernan, for example, won't let anybody else paste the clippings in the scrapbook. She's got to do all that herself, and uh, it turns out to be a pretty big job on a flight that's had the kind of national and worldwide coverage that this one has. Um, they're a little worried, I think, but they, they really don't show it. There's a great air of calm and cheerfulness and, uh, and business as usual uh, in these uh, little communities around here, Nassau Bay and El Lago. And they all seem to be taking the flight very well. They love the television. That's, uh, that's the most popular thing NASA's ever done from the wives' point of view. Bruce, uh, just before the mission in a conversation with Gene Cernan, he said essentially that knowledge is strength. And so he tries to tell his wife as much as possible as he can about just uh, what is involved in a space flight. Uh, and I think it is true, the more you study this, uh, the more you realize the, that there, there is enough behind here. There is room really to make mistakes. Remember, that's what Dave Scott said, uh, was the lesson he drew from that uh, ordeal of Gemini 8 when suddenly he and Neil Armstrong tumbled out of control and down into the uh, Pacific Ocean, not on schedule. He said that uh, after that particular experience, uh, he realized that quite a bit could go wrong before really anyone would get hurt. 